that we are forever changed this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat if you would. Take a Bible and turn to the book of John. John chapter 10. We got a lot of stuff up here. It's pretty interesting. I could go for days. <laughs> oh, sorry. Never mind. Um, John chapter 10. We're going to look at some things that are, I think are kind of interesting. Have you ever... Maybe I should maybe I should just ask this. How's your week been? See, I, most of the time we get to this point, we get a little upbeat song, we get a little encouraged, we get a little excited. I, I got to tell you, I needed that. I feel like I'm a, my batteries are a little down. I feel like a, I don't need I don't need a jump start yet, but it's close. Every time I go, I might not crank. Uh, anyway, uh, I was thinking about while we were singing and. Uh, you know how my mind is. I think about 14 different things. I was thinking about a time when I was 17 years old. And uh, un unlike uh, most of my friends, uh, I didn't, my parents didn't give me a car. I had to earn my car. And I don't know if you remember, uh, there were some stores in Houston that were going out of business. And my dad worked for those stores. And so I climbed around the rafters of those stores and cut two-inch copper pipes out. Took them home and set them in a fire and melted the insulation off and I worked real hard to get that up there. Got, got a little bit of money together and bought a, a 1971 Toyota Corolla. Fine automobile. Well, not really. If you let go of the steering wheel, it would dart off the road. You wouldn't worry about hitting that door because if you just let go of the steering wheel, you'd be down the hallway. <laughs> kind of used tires. You bought used tires because they weren't going to last long anyway. Anyway, um, then you combine that with a 17-year-old kid. 17-year-old uh, boy. With... A 17-year-old boy's thought process. You still with me? One day, uh, we were leaving school and I ran track and stuff. And we had some people that I, I knew. And me and a buddy of mine, I was taking him home. And so there were some friends of ours that wanted to go home. And so we ended up with me and my, my friend and five girls in this little Toyota car, Corolla car. Um, I missed a curve because I didn't know where she lived. And the last minute, she said, turn here. And it was a gravel road. Anyways, I hit this tree. Tree pushes the front end of my little car in. We get everybody home, go over to his dad's house. His dad, long story I know, just bear with me. We're, we're getting somewhere, trust me. Uh, we get a winch truck that his dad owned, a winch truck. We winch my car off of that tree and take it home. I am sure none of this is legal, by the way. I don't, I don't know what kind of permits you have to have to even drive a truck like that. I'm sure two 17-year-old guys didn't have it. But we got it home. My dad walks in after work, and I'm in the front yard with my car, and I have a hydraulic jack turned sideways, and I've taken the radiator out, and I have a hydraulic jack, and I'm trying to get the front end of the car to get out far enough so I can figure out what else is damaged. And do you know what my dad did? He looks over, and I saw him look over. He looks over, never says a word, and walks in the house. Now, I don't know where, I, I, I'm not sure where, you know, you kind of get at. Wouldn't that be a point where you'd at least be curious? Hey, what happened? Even if you weren't going down the road of, hey, you need some help. I get that. Not your problem. I get that. Uh, but, but wouldn't you at least be curious? See, the reason I use that story is not because I want you to think how strange I was as a child, although I probably was. Um, but I, I find my every day, every single day, I look around and go, I got to ask about that. Because that's strange. That's just bizarre. Why is that happening? And when I look at God's word, I begin to think, you know, God knew that was coming. And he, and he laid things out. You, you think I've kind of missed it, right? Well, I got a phone conversation for you from someone who complained to a grocery store. I won't read the name of the grocery store. Okay. Um, the guy that answers the phone, he says, thank you for calling uh, whatever grocery store. How can I help you? Customer. I bought peanut butter. Now I don't know what to do with it. Excuse me? You had a peanut butter sale. Buy two, get one free. I bought two, got one free. I don't know what to do with it. I'm sorry, ma'am. That's not the fault of the store. Well, what do I do with it? He said, put it in a sandwich. Do you know how many calories are in a sandwich? With peanut butter? There's 
200 calories in that. Man, I, I'm sorry. You, you think I'm making this up. I'm reading it. It's true. It's factual. Mel, I'm sorry, but I don't really know what to do with your peanut butter. I don't care if you don't tell me. I, no, I, I don't care. If you don't tell me what to do with it right now, I'm going to complain to the manager and have you fired. Mel, I don't know what to do with your peanut butter. Customer, what do I do with my peanut butter? Last response, I don't know. Make cookies. Give a jar to a friend. Donate it to a homeless shelter. Are you kidding me? Do you know how much peanut butter costs? <laughs> See, I've gotten, I've gotten to wonder, are we in a world, uh, first of all, are we in a world where stuff like that happens? Yes, yes we are. Yes. Secondly, are we in a place in our world where that's going to become the acceptable norm? Not just the norm. Just the norm? Yeah. You see, when God says in his word here, especially Jesus in the Gospel of John, he points to a, a picture that's very, very clear. And it's a drastic difference between the good shepherd, God, and everybody else. And I think we forgot how much of a drastic difference there's supposed to be between God and everyone else. Jesus, the good shepherd, is this irreplaceable and, and uh, incredibly valuable person. That, that's exactly how you feel, right? Each week you feel incredibly valuable, right? Incredibly strong, incredibly capable, right? No? Most of us are trying to squeak our way through the week. I said I wasn't going to say anything politically, but I, I, I can't. I gotta, I gotta throw one thing in there. Most of us treat our lives like the CDC create, creates and and treats announcements. You're like, what? No, seriously. One day it's wear your mask and wear it inside and wear it outside and do all these things, and then the next day it's oh, you're good to go if you've been vaccinated. Did the science change? Because I try to keep up with science, and just in case you're wondering, I can't figure it out. See, I don't want to base my, I don't want to base my life, I don't want to base my eternity on someone's speculation. Do you? Here's another sidebar for you, and I'm going to let you off the hook, and then we're going to read a couple of scriptures. You better not even base your eternity on my opinion. You better get into there and get looking. I'm not saying I have all the right answers. What I'm telling you is I got bunches of questions and somewhere through here I've been fighting for some answers. John chapter 1, I mean chapter 10 verse 1. I'm going to read a few verses and this kind of gives us the background of, of what Jesus is saying here. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the, by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the stranger. Jesus uses used this illustration but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. See, I love that. I love that parable because he's talking about how valuable and important the, the shepherd is. And I love, the, maybe it's just me, but I love the fact that they get to the end and you know what they do? What? I don't get it. I don't understand. You ever get that way? You ever tried to read this book and, and suddenly you're like, whoa, what? Or, or, sometimes, or sometimes you get part of the way and you think, well, God's telling me to do this. I need to get this straight in my life. I need to do this in my life. And I, you start down that road and, I, and then all the wheels come off the cart. Pretty awesome, isn't it? No. It's like, come on, man. I, I'm trying, God. I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to think better. And everything keeps coming unraveled. See, they needed someone to give them wisdom and guidance and understanding. You know, that's a weird and strange and 
mysterious unicorn. Wisdom, guidance, understanding. I feel like it's the little troll that's hiding under the bridge that nobody can find. See, there's got to be this point we sh where we stand with God and, it, and things shouldn't be treated uh, as the world tells us, but, but we should base things on, I, I don't know if I can, can I say this out loud? We're just friends, right? I'll go ahead and say it. You won't hold me too much accountable, right? We should base things on according to what value they have. That's a weird concept, isn't it? You're like, what does that mean? Well, you know, mo most of the time, uh, we just kind of live life fighting fires, don't we? What problem? What treachery? What dis difficulty to deal with? Maybe if we just live life based on what's valuable, well then, who, who, places, who gets to place value to give us an understanding of what's valuable and what's not? Because I will tell you, people in West Texas, people around here, have different valuables than people in other parts of the country. They look at things different. It's not good or bad, just different. Verse 7 through 9 tell us something really important. It says if we're going to do those, those things that are important, those things that are valuable, those things that, that help us get closer to God, to be right with God, we've got to first of all have the acknowledgement of Jesus. So you can't you, you can't get things straight. I know this is oversimplification and a long way to get here, but you can't get things right in life without Jesus. And somehow we, we got the idea that if I just, if I work hard and clean things up, it'll be better. It may be better, but it won't be Christ-like because you can't be Christ-like without Christ. Right? So in here somewhere, we've got to make the transition and stop looking at the things that, it, it's kind of like your, your warranties. You, you love warranties, right? You ever like, you like dealing, calling with warranties, right? Like, you like dealing with that when stuff breaks down? It's kind of like that. We trust in that piece of paper and then what we find out is there's a deductible we didn't know about. Or there's some kind of exclusion. Yes, the part that broke on yours is covered, but not on Thursday. And you called on Thursday. See, we acknowledge that, and that acknowledgement has to say that sometimes there are things that, that are above and beyond us. Verse 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. He says that this acknowledgement sometimes takes several explanations. And, and he didn't go away. And I don't know if you do this or not. You ever, you ever misunderstand? Or I'm getting a little older and I don't hear quite as well. And Every once in a while I do silly things like run too much or get dehydrated or whatever and, and it affects my hearing. I, I'm trying to convince everybody around me that it affects my hearing. <laughs> so if I don't hear you, it's because I did something and my ears are messed up, right? It's not because I'm not listening, right? So we got that all on the table, okay? Um, Jesus doesn't go back and say, why don't you get it? Why don't you understand? He doesn't refuse to answer again. Do you know that God is infinitely patient with you? Come on now. Don't you know that he's infinitely patient with you? He is with me. There's another thing about this acknowledgement, though. The acknowledgement requires admittance. Well, what does that mean? Verse 8. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So those that came before, there's, there's got to be this this acknowledgement that there is only one source, one way, and his name is Jesus Christ? That, that, that there's got to be this realization somewhere in my heart and in my mind that Jesus is the one that gets me to where I need to be? Is that what you're saying, Wayne? Exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what God's saying. He doesn't say, he doesn't say fix everything and then confess and come to me. He says just confess. Confess so much, so deeply, that you believe in your heart things are different. And then do this weird, really weird thing. Begin to live that way. And do you know that things will be different? I, I know, I know where you're going with this, though, right? You want to? Are, are you like me? Don't you want to predict or 
or at least have some control over what different looks like. Wouldn't that be nice? You're not going to admit it, are you? I admit it. I like, I like, I like for things to kind of fall into place. I work with a guy, he's, I consider him a friend, and he has control issues. We work in a in an environment that's uh, sterile and stuff, and you're driving a machine, it's got a x-ray machine on the tubes, and multi-million dollar machine, I mean, it's a lot of stuff, but he, he, he's got to drive. If he wants to see a little further up, he's not going to ask you to see further up, he's going to grab the handle and drive. He's got some control issues going on there. And we would never harass him about that. Right. Okay, maybe we would, a lot. But you know what we also do? We also understand. Do you know that we all have characteristics, certain characteristics that push our buttons? And the things that push my button may not be like yours. But they're still just as important. We have to admit, we have to acknowledge, it, it, it requires us to make a stand with or without Jesus Christ. Verse 9. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. He says he'll, things will fall in place. If, if you'll acknowledge Jesus as the one, you will find this place of security and this place of refuge. Sorry, I'm probably going to step out of camera here. They'll all wonder online what's going on. But when I am hot, I don't really worry about it too much. But when I see other people hot, I'm thinking, it may really be hot. And the great thing is that I'm up here. You can't get to the thermostat right now. <laughs> Anyways, we have to acknowledge that there's this secure place in action, that we have to be a place where God can take care of us. I don't know about you, but and maybe I should just ask you, do you really want to be someplace where God provides provision for you? Where God takes care of you? where God shows his love to and through and for you? I do. And I want it more and more as I get older. I don't, I don't know why that is, but I want, I want things to fall into place. See, there's a second part of this. The acknowledgement of Jesus is paramount, but also the application of purpose. I, I don't know about you. I, I've told people this all of my life probably. I don't mind doing something once, but I really despise most things twice. It's just the way I am. I don't mind doing something once. I can endure something pretty, pretty painful once, but I don't want to go through it twice. Verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Man, what a great verse. What a, what a great impact. And, and maybe what a great and timely message for our world today. Do you, do you see the contrast there? There is this one who comes to kill and destroy. The one who comes to seek to, to revenge and, and to pummel those that are on the, in that path. And their only chore, their only desire is to tear people down. And then there's another one who comes to bring life. And that they might have life more abundantly. But I think... I think we've got a little problem in our world today. I think we've somehow confused abundant life with an abundance of life. You're like, uh-oh, where's this going? Well, I think it's pretty straightforward, right? In life, we have this, this idea that, that an abundance is good. We should seek that abundance. My grandfather, all of his life, was notorious and still is. I still remember this as a kid. If if you could tighten a bolt, a quarter turn, it surely will go a half turn. And he twisted off more bolts, more times than you could ever imagine. And I don't know if you've ever heard this. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. There's this strange shrieking sound that a bolt gives out right before it confesses and dies. And he still... He's still good. If a little bit's good, a lot's better. And then you have to get out a die set. You got to drill it out. You got, you got like five times as much work to get that one little bolt out. You ever been there? You know, the problem is most of us are living our life in such a way that we do that exact same thing. We think that the more, 
more is better. Instead of realizing, God said that he wanted to give you abundant life. Well, what's abundant life? Abundant life is the contrast in where, where it says, I can have one thing, but I see the vibrance of that one thing. I see the value of that one thing. I am, can I even use this word nowadays? I am content with what God has given me. We have lost that commodity. We have lost that ability. Now it's everything's about the next thing and our world has gotten glorious in and, and, and promoted that in a grand way. I wear out remote after remote trying to get through commercials and they figure out ways to make me have to stop and watch those anyway. <laughs> They'll put the same actors in the show that I'm walking, watching in the commercial. That's unfair. <laughs> Nobody should have that right. What happens though is we begin to, to buy into the fact, well, I need, I need, you ask, a, you ask a young person today, what do they need? They need a cell phone. They need certain kinds of shoes. They, they need, I can run down the list. We, we need, well, do we really? I mean, honestly? See, sometimes in the pursuit, in the pursuit of something new, in the pursuit of something new, we don't see the color and the beauty of what we currently have. Now, every once in a while, every once in a while, what we have is just junk. And it gets old fighting the junk. You know what God is saying there? You were, please hear this, you were born as one who would be junk. And I am willing to give you complete life, whole life, never to be considered junk again. Why would anybody turn that down? Why, why would anybody say, I don't, I don't want any part of that? We somehow got the idea that just because people can make millions of dollars a year, it somehow makes them valuable and important. Do you know what we learned this week on the East Coast? It doesn't matter how much money you have, you still can't get gas just like the rest of us. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are we going to do? What is anybody going to do when there is no hope other than that one, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, John says it well. He says we have to know that there's a purpose and there's a process that God has impl implemented and it's for our good. And, it, and it, it is a constant battle for us to look at what is abundant as opposed to an abundance. What about verse 11? See, this purpose is not to just show us the difference between the, that abundant and abundance of life, but also the purpose is to share the truth. What did I say we were at? Verse 11? Uh -huh. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Isn't that amazing that God, God gives the, the, the very life that he has for us? His purpose, his purpose was to come and share. And you know, we, we've tried that recently in our world to the tune of trillions of dollars. And we began to, not began, we continue to throw money at situations. Do you know there are things in life that money can't fix? <laughs> in the process, we've got to realize that Jesus came that he might be the sacrificial shepherd that he might make the difference. That he might pay the debt that you have. That he might make the payment that you could never pay. And here's the kicker. Here's the glory side to me. He will make that payment once and then you are no longer responsible for it. Ever. No matter how those around you mismanage things. The purpose was to share. The purpose also is to solidify the difference between Jesus and and everyone else, just like I said a moment ago, Luke verse 12. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. 
As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I am bringing, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. See, he wants to bring everyone, everyone together. Do you know that, do you know that most flocks or herds, that unification, that togetherness is protection? They come together for protection. The more that you are together, the better you are protected. That's the way that God is. He wants to bring us closer and unite us more. Instead of dividing us where we are in solitude and where we're vulnerable. Now is the time to run toward those who are like-minded and like-hearted. There is no doubt. Last thing. We know this acknowledgement of Jesus and we see the application of the purpose. What about, what about simply just appreciating the gift? I've been, told, uh, I've been told that I'm horrible at this. Are you, are you good at appreciating gifts? See, I never know the appropriate response. You know, my kids can just condition me for years. You, you can only get so excited about socks and ties. And eventually I gave up the ties and the socks went away. Maybe they were tied together. Oh, never, never mind. Um, but it's hard about some gifts. Some gifts are great and glorious and you're all excited about it, but maybe you don't, maybe you don't gush like they were expecting. Do you know there needs to be a, a, a greater appreciation brought back to our lives? Do you know that appreciation is the, is the, the pivot point wherewith we can deal with most tragedies? If we appreciate the life that God has given us, even in the hard times, we can lean on Him. They don't have to make sense. I don't have to like them. Well, if I'm going to appreciate the gift, what do I got to do? There's three quick things. It won't take long for us to look at them. First one's there in verse 17. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. The first thing is, is, is that to appreciate something, you really have to love it. If you have an indifference for it, you're really probably not going to really appreciate it. You may not even remember where it is. I've become to, knowledgeable enough to know that all the time growing up, I, I blamed my kids for a lot of things. But one of them was, one of them was, and it finally it came true, they would hide cereal from me. I know, that's horrible, isn't it? And I would know. We'd go to the grocery store. I know there's a box of cereal. I bought that box of cereal. It's gone. I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew which one did it. Couldn't catch him. You know why I couldn't catch him? It wasn't him. It was her. And she let him take the rap for years. And if you ask her about it today, she loves the fact that he got in trouble for it. <laughs> See, I was, I was running down the wrong route. To, to, really, to really appreciate something, it doesn't have to be valuable to someone else. It needs to be valuable to me. It needs to be important to me. And, and I might even go further to, to say, do you know that love is the official language of appreciation? That word's thrown around a lot, but the reality is if you truly love someone, you will appreciate them. Maybe you don't say it enough, but you really will appreciate them. So love is the official language of appreciation. Secondly, loyalty is the power behind love. Verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up. This command I have received from my Father. Jesus said, I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to lay it down because I want to, because I love you. And out of that expression of love, he doesn't look for those who are lovable. He looks for those who need love. Isn't that incredible? And he says, I will be loyal. I will lay my life down because that's what's important or necessary for you. And do you know that he, in a, in a form or in a fashion, lays down his, his life each and every day for us? There's a verse in the Bible that, 
and sometimes it's misread, sometimes misquoted, but it in essence says that God is patient and long-suffering, that none should perish. You know what he's telling you? My loyalty saved your life. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God is loyal? Especially in a world where there doesn't seem to be much loyalty. So love is the official language of appreciation. Loyalty is the power behind love. And then lastly, this is, this is, the, this is the true unicorn in our world today. This mystery animal used to exist. It used to roam the hills just like the buffalo. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little carried away. Um, but but you, will, you might find it, but it's going to be hard to find. This little unicorn is called logic. <laughs> yeah, we could go into this for a while. But logic is the mysterious missing ingredient in following and living and loving and serving Jesus Christ. Verse 19. See, after a, after a speech like this, wouldn't you think, and wouldn't you think if you got to sit down with Jesus, wouldn't you think that it would impact you? Don't you think you'd buy in whatever he said? I mean, you'd be straightforward, right? <laughs> no, not so much. Verse 19. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because these sayings, and many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? You know what they did? And it didn't take long. I don't know what the time frame was there, but I imagine it's just like... But immediately they begin to draw up sides. Weird, isn't it? I'm so glad we'd never act like that. We never choose sides or, or build walls based on, on religion or based on race or, or, or based on anything. We wouldn't do that, right? Well, I want to tell you something. There's a group of people in our world that exactly want to do that. And you have to make a stand. You have to make a stand and determine that God is the source and the guide of my life. And I appreciate Him so much that if He's willing to die for everyone, everyone has value. Everyone. And I refuse to be that person that is put in a category to draw up sides. And, and you got to hear this. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's money or no money. I don't care if it's job or no job. I don't, I don't care. If, I, none of it matters. I refuse to be one of those people who's going to be pushed to choose sides. Even down to the fact of vaccinated or unvaccinated. God is not about choosing sides. He's about sharing His love. And in that essence and in that path and in that process, that in itself will take care of the sides. That is not your job. That is not my job. And God is willing to love me as bad as I've been. Surely I can give Him the grace to love others. Logic is not something we're leaning on lately. And I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but we aren't getting any smarter. Somehow we just got to get back to the basics and say, God, it is you. And I acknowledge that. And I confess that. And I trust that. I don't have everything worked out, God, as you can see. But I'm, but I'm here. And I'm with you. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity you've given us this day to look at your word. Lord, I thank you that you are patient and long-suffering and willing to give us insight after insight and guide us through a path that leads us closer to you. Lord, I pray that you would block out all the noise and distractions and the trappings of this world and allow us to see and understand you in a deep way. Lord, I pray that if there are those here today who, who are wrestling with the noise, struggling with the pain, stumbling through the pitfalls, I pray that you give them strength. That in this moment, they would feel a comfort and a peace and a touch.